I want to just thank, uh, always, Pastor Parsley for the opportunity I, to share the word. I want to thank Elder Bill Canfield for the excellent delivery on these first three lessons in the We Sing series. I, I'm, I, I was so impressed by his ability to, to sing through that. I don't know that I'm going to do that much singing tonight. Uh, but I, could, I cannot say enough. I, I took a lot of notes from him. And uh, I love the way that he was highly participa participatory. I guess is the right word. He called for the participation of the congregation. And really that's in keeping with the very nature of the Psalms. The book of Psalms was not primarily written to be studied or analyzed. Now we have to study it because we don't have the context and all of that without study. We have to study it. But for the original recipients of the Psalms, uh, it was just songs, not just songs, but they were songs that they sang. They were, uh, it's like poetry that was recited. Some of it was intended for instruction. Uh, there were hymns, there were laments, there were just all sorts of, of, of uh, types of psalms there. But we're continuing tonight with the We Sing uh, series, an in-depth study in the book of Psalms. And before we get into the specific text that I want to focus in on tonight, and I am primarily looking at one of the psalms, I just want to share a little bit of what happened in my life in 1988. That was probably a year or two before some of you were born. But that was early in my ministry. Early, real early, you know, right, I was right out of the kindergarten at the time. No, I'm just kidding on that. In 1988, my wife and I were serving in an associate capacity in a church. And I won't get into the gory details, but uh, we, we were going through a rough time. Uh, not in our marriage. Our mar thank God our marriage has been good and strong and intact for years and years and years. But, but and, uh, Praise God. Glory to, glory to God for that. But there were a lot of things going on in our world at the time, in our, our little world, that were just, it, it was falling apart. And I found myself for three days, and this was in the state of Maine, I, I went to the rocky coastline. Anybody here ever been to Maine? You know what the coastline is like there? I mean, the rocky coast. I went and spent three days on those rocks. I was fasting. I was praying. I took my Bible. I took my journal. I took a bottle of water. And for three days, I watched the tide go out and the tide come in. For three days, in the middle of the summer, under the scorching heat, Three days there, my hands were upon that bare rock, and I said, oh, God, I feel like my, my life has been stripped down to nothing but just something that's bare and naked like these rocks. I cried out to God. But then I opened my Bible, and I began to pray through the book of Psalms. For three days, I prayed through the Psalms. I prayed through the laments. I prayed through the psalms of thanksgiving. I prayed through the wisdom psalms. I prayed through the hymns. I prayed through, through the psalms of declaration of trust and, and all of these things. I prayed all 150 psalms. I didn't read it. I didn't study it. I prayed it back to God. I prayed it to Him. My heart became welded with that portion of the Scripture. I, I have to read psalms every week. I'm in the psalms in some capacity. You know, every conceivable human emotion is there, you know. Great joy and also great depths of sorrow and anguish. But the thing that I've noticed in the Psalms, that even those Psalms where you see the lament and you see the anguish, the psalmist somehow was still able to turn his voice in a declaration of trust in his God. And so it is with us. And I came out of that whole experience with new guidance, a new sense of direction. In fact, the very spot where I was praying was called Two Lights because there were two lighthouses, an old one and a new one that had been built. 
And I turned and I saw that and said, on this day, in this three days of praying, I have found new direction in my life. And it was all out of being immersed in that book of Psalms, crying out to my God. I want to talk to you tonight about one specific psalm that's very familiar to all of us. It's a psalm that I really tried to resist, including in the series. The reason I tried to resist including it is because it's so commonly referred to. And I thought, oh, they've heard a million sermons on that psalm. Certainly, you're not telling me to preach that one and teach that one. And, and I tried to go to this one and that one. I kept bumping into Psalm 23. <laughs> and that's where we are tonight. You know, David, the author of this psalm, he uh, was a shepherd. We're not exactly sure when he wrote this. It could have been could have been before he was anointed as king. If that's the case, then there's a line in it that is prophetic of what was about to happen in his life. If it was after he was anointed as king, then it was a reflection on his royal identity. Okay? I'm talking about the part of the Psalms that says, Thou anointest my head with oil. But I want us to look at it, and we're going to put it on the screen for you. Psalm 23, beginning with verse 1. And I'm going to take this one verse at a time. And it begins like this, and I just want you to get this picture of David. He's, he's in the fields. He's looking at the stars at night. He's, he's pondering God and who God is. He wants a deeper knowledge of God. But then he starts thinking about his life as a shepherd. How he had to care for his sheep. How he was always with his sheep. How when the enemy was nearby, he would grab his rod or his sling and he'd fight off foxes and wolves, even bears, lions, whatever, whatever was coming his way. He would defend his sheep. He would provide for his sheep. And he's pondering all of this. And all of a sudden, it dawns on him, wait a minute. That's what my Lord is like. The Lord is my shepherd. I know what my heart is toward these sheep. That's what his heart is toward me. In this psalm, we see a revelation of the heart of God toward his people. We see a revelation of the heart of God toward you. And tonight, somebody in this place tonight is going to receive a breakthrough in believing what God feels about you. Not just what He thinks about you, not just what He says about you in His Word in some generic sense, but what He feels about you specifically tonight. There's also someone in this room that's going to experience restoration in some area of your life tonight. And the impression I had that there is an oppression that's trying to come over somebody's mind in this place and in Jesus name I declare already that there's anointing released in this room that's going to break that oppression off of your mind so just be soaking in the Holy Spirit and the sound of the word tonight until we get to that point where that release comes the Lord is my shepherd he says I shall not want you know when I was a kid I could not understand that when I was a little child. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Of course I want him. I thought it meant I didn't know. It, it said I shall not want him. But obviously you know. I mean, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. I shall not lack for anything. That there, being unfulfilled is not a reality in my life when I realize that he is my shepherd. Anything that would have been a void in my life is filled because He is my shepherd. I am not alone in life because He is my shepherd. I don't need to fear that I'm not going to be provided for because He is my shepherd. Am I ever going to lack in guidance? Am I ever going to be in want of that? He is always there leading me. He is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want of anything. It's a, and I like saying it like this. It doesn't say it in the Hebrew. But this is the way I see it. 
the Lord is my shepherd. What more could I want? Verse 2. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Now, this isn't like parents, you go to your little kids and, say, and you make your kids take their nap. Say, now, you better go take your nap. <laughs> it's not like that. It's more like he causes us to lie down in green pastures. Now, you've got to get the imagery here. This is where we have to study this. You get the imagery of where this is taking place, where these psalms are being written. The Judean desert is really where a lot of the grazing of the sheep took place. And I've only been to Israel once. It was on the study tour. My wife and I had a chance to go to study through the Gospel of Luke while we were in Israel. We went to all the sites that related to the Gospel of Luke. But then one day, our instructor, he had a little extra time. and said, let's go to Bethlehem. And we're not just going to talk about Luke. We're going to look at the Psalms because this teacher that we had, this guide, he had spent considerable time with the Bedouin shepherds in the Judean desert and spent a good deal of time with them. They became his friends. And we saw some of those Bedouin uh, shepherds with their sheep in the desert. And going down the road in the tour bus and looking over that Judean desert, you'd see those sheep down there and their faces are down in the dirt as though they're eating dirt. You wonder, what are they eating? It's a desert. There's nothing there. But then you get closer and you see there's little strands of grass, little strands of vegetation here and there. They would literally have their faces down in the dirt all day long just looking for morsels of something like that to eat all day long. Because in reality, the food was scarce. And the point that I'm making here is a green pasture is a great blessing. When you spend a long time in a desert, when you spend a long time that everything within you is just trying to, you're just trying to make it. You're just trying to survive. You're in that desert place. And so the dream of a green pasture is, is, is quite a reality to you. You long for that greener pasture. Now, where people get in trouble is when they get this mentality of the grass is greener is on the other side, and they make their own decisions. They try to get themselves out of the desert. There's only one who knows how to lead us out of this desert, and that is the Lord, our shepherd. Looking for greener pastures. The promise is is actually implied in this. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. But how does a shepherd make sheep lie down? There are four basic conditions that have to be met if a sheep is to lie down. Four basic conditions. <clears throat> Number one, a sheep will not lie down in a pasture or anywhere if the sheep is hungry. A hungry sheep, as long as there's hunger, and that hunger is not satisfied, the sheep will not lie down. They'll just stand there. Because they feel like, I've got to go find something to eat. They're not going to lie down and rest. Hunger has to be satisfied. So the shepherd knows, I've got to satisfy the hunger. And the Lord, our shepherd, he's committed to satisfy our hunger. In fact, I refuse to be at ease until I have ingested the bread of his word. I refuse to be at ease if, I'm not, if I have not yet in a day taken in what the Lord has to say. Jesus said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. May He give us an appetite for every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We can cultivate that hunger. We need to have this realization. That's what we need in order to be able to lie down. A second condition that must be met is thirst has to be quenched. A thirsty sheep will not lie down because it has it in its mind. I've got to find something to satisfy this thirst. Well, the good shepherd is faithful to lead, lead us to living water. In fact, he himself is that spring of living water. The Holy Spirit is that living water. The God that we serve has provided all that we need to quench our thirst. The word thirst is sometimes used for words like, uh, it's, it's synonymous with 
even desire or even lust. And, but aren't you glad that we do not have to give in to carnal desire because God Himself has supplied all we need to satisfy the longings of our hearts, bodies, and souls. In fact, there's several places in the Psalms that talks about my heart and my flesh cry out to the living God. My heart and my flesh. Oh, wait a minute. I can understand my heart crying out to Him. But my flesh, that's a part of me that sins. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're thinking an old way of thinking there. I believe we're supposed to get to such a point in our walk with God, and I'm not talking about hyper-perfectionism here. I'm talking about a matter of faith here. Will we trust what God has provided for us? What you have at your access is what you have access to is closer than you think to where your desire for God doesn't just have to be your heart, it can be even your flesh. Yes, I'm talking about your body. Yes, may we be so immersed in the presence of God, may we be so fed by Him, so our thirst so quenched by Him that even our flesh is crying out for Him. So, He leads me, or makes me lie down in green pastures, because hunger and, th hunger and thirst have to be satisfied, those two conditions, to make us lie down. A third condition that must be satisfied, dirt and parasites need to be removed from that sheep's nostrils, from that sheep's face. Yeah, I know it's nasty, but as I told you earlier, those sheep, they had their face in the dirt all day long. And with their face in the dirt, bugs would get there. Some of them were very dangerous parasites. And at the end of the day, or even periodically during the day, that sheep, that shepherd would come to that sheep and lift its head until that sheep was looking into his eyes. Now this is the gross part, this, but it shows the love of the shepherd. With his very fingers, the shepherd would thrust his fingers into the nostrils of that sheep and scoop out that grimy stuff of bugs and dirt. Why? Because he knew that that sheep needed to be cleansed and delivered. Did you hear me? The sheep needed to be cleansed and delivered. Without the cleansing, without the deliverance from the parasites, that sheep would not, that sheep would be irritated. It would be uneasy. It, can I, you, I don't even have to make that application. You know where I'm going with this. When you are tormented by the things of the devil, now sometimes, let me just say this. We're not talking about you just, you, oh, you sinned this week and you have to get forgiven. Of course, that's a problem. Repent of that. Get cleansing for that. But do you know that even a person with a good heart, someone that's upright in spirit, just by simply walking through this world, sometimes by just being near the evil, it just kind of rubs off on you. You ever been there? You'd be around a bunch of people, they're talking in a bad way, and they're doing things they shouldn't be doing. You're not participating. You don't even want to hear it. You don't even want to see it. But you turn around to leave, and you feel defiled. And, hey, your good shepherd, he's ready to get that off of you. Now, somebody here is going to be freed from some sense of guilt and condemnation that don't really belong to you. Now, if you've sinned, yeah, you need to feel guilty on that. You need to repent of that. But I'm talking about the things that either God's already forgiven you of or the things you had no fault in where the enemy's trying to make you feel guilty for it. You've picked up some kind of grime along the way just by being around this junk. He does not condemn you. There's no condemnation against you. He's present to lift your head, to cleanse you, to deliver you. So the dirt and parasites have to be removed. Number four, that sheep needs to feel secure. And what was the, <laughs> his very presence, the shepherd's very presence, made the sheep feel secure. Just being there. So what are we saying with all of this? Hey, I'm not going to be at ease until I've taken in his word. I'm not going to be e at ease until I've taken in the water of his spirit. I'm not going to be at ease until I've allowed him, if I need it, I'm going to get some cleansing from him. I'm going to get some deliverance from him. I'm not going to be at ease until I have centered in upon His presence, that He is present with me, and there I feel secure. And not only, not only does He lead me to lie down in green pastures, He leads me beside the still waters. Now in Judea, to find a moving stream of water was a great gift. 
in the desert. But sometimes those streams moved swiftly. They were often seasonal streams, and when they were flowing, they were usually swift because the, the ground was baked. It was clay-like in places, and, and the water ran swiftly across the top of the ground in places. And, and the sheep would really want to just go right in there, but the problem is those Judean sheep, they had this thick wool under their, their neck that if they put their head down in there, there was a somewhat of a siphoning effect when that water would grab a hold of that wool that had the potential of pulling them into the water and drowning them. And a lot of sheep out on their own without their shepherd there would drown because of that very thing. But this verse says, He leads me beside still waters. Still waters, not rushing waters. Here's what the shepherd would do. He'd come with his staff to this moving water. He would stand between the sheep and the swift water. They, be, they were fearful of the swift water. There's a lot of people fearful of the swift water of the Spirit. They say, I don't like that revival stuff. Now, I'm not sure about this Holy Ghost stuff. You know, that looks kind of weird to me. I don't know. What if something bad happens to me? That doesn't make any sense at all. You know, what if something bad happens to me if I get into the Spirit? You know, that just doesn't make sense. But there's, there's a fear. It's an irrational fear. But here's the thing. The shepherd knows all about your fears. And he's right there. He's ready with that staff well, to literally, if he has to, he'll cut out a channel on the side. And with that staff, he'll dig out a small pool to the side just so that you can get a drink of water out of a still pool of water where it is safe. And on top of that, he will stand between the still pool and the rushing stream so that when you look up from drinking from that still pool of water, you're looking at him and not the danger that's beyond him. See, Jesus, we're we know we're talking about Jesus here. He said, I'm the good shepherd. Jesus is so committed to you being secure. He's so committed to you feel even feeling safe in your uncertain circumstances. And he's standing right there. He says, I'm standing between you and the things you're afraid of. And I have prepared the things that you need right in front of you. A still pool of water. Verse 3. He restores my soul. Can you say that with me? He restores my soul. And we'll read the rest of it later, but... If you restore an automobile, you're getting that auto automobile back into its original state of newness. If you restore a dead battery, you're replenishing the power in that battery. It regains power, energy, and potential to do something. If you restore an old dilapidated house, it becomes suitable for habitation. And things can live there again and serve its purpose. When he restores a soul, what is the soul? The mind, the will, and your emotions. And this is the point, if you will receive it, somebody in the room, even right now as I'm teaching it, you're receiving a breakthrough in your mind. That oppressive cloud that's been over you, I just command in Jesus' name, break off of this person right now in Jesus' name. That tormenting thought, that patterns of thought, like, I don't want that to be there. I don't want to feel like this. It's just with me all the time. It goes now. You draw a line in the sand tonight. This is the end of it. I declare it in the name of Jesus, by the power of Jesus, by the delivering power of Jesus. And please come up to us afterwards if something's happening with you. Something is happening with somebody in this room. I, I, I sense it in the room tonight. A deliverance of the mind. A restoring of the soul, of the mind, the will, the emotions. I just don't feel it anymore. He restores the emotions. I don't know that I even have the desire anymore. He restores the will. I'm just not thinking clearly on the things of God anymore. Other things are distracting me. He restores the mind. He restores the soul. It's another way of saying He brings revival. He revitalizes us. He revives us. He's ready even now to revive his entire flock. Hallelujah.
We are in the midst of revival. Anybody catch on to that lately? That we're in the midst of it? Sometimes you can get so close to it that you forget what's happening. Not every place on the planet's like what's going on here. I don't, I don't know if you know that or not. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. It, 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 this is not so much in the original language as much as it is understanding what a path was in Judea. You stand on a hillside in Judea and look at a path. It's not just a, a gently winding path like some of these bicycle trails I like to ride my bike on around here. It, it's not a, really a straight path. These were meandering paths. You can stand on one hillside and look over to the next and just all these meandering paths. It looks like to go half a mile, you've got to go 20 miles to get there because you've got to wind around this wadi and, and this little valley and come back over here or go down through that valley of the shadow of death to get over there. It was a complicated thing. He leads me in the meandering paths of righteousness. Sometimes life takes twists and turns that I did not anticipate. Sometimes things go a direction that I did not prepare for. In those times, I cannot rely upon intuition. I can't rely upon my education. I can't re rely upon my intelligence. I can't even rely on the advice of others sometimes. I need the shepherd. Do you realize that he's already been down that path ahead of you? He knows the way. And it is a path of righteousness. Another way of thinking of it is it's the right path. It's always going to be the right path if he's the one that's leading you. He leads me in the meandering paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He's going to lead you in a way that's going to bring him glory. Verse 4. Yea. Why on earth do you say yea over this one? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Yea. That should be woe. <laughs> yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Did you get my emphasis? <laughs> yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. No, 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 no. A lot of times we, we read this psalm at funerals, and it does bring comfort in times of death, and I'm not making light of that. I have drawn from this psalm in times of sorrow. I have. But if you look at this carefully, this is not just a psalm about the shepherd consoling us. It's not just a psalm about him comforting us. The, the element of comfort is here. That aspect uh, it is, is here in this psalm. But it is, there's something more going on than that. Yea, though I walk through the valley. You're going through it, friends. Through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm walking through the valley of uncertain times. I'm going through the valley that is dangerous. Now, going back to the literal valley in the Judean desert, they had the, uh, the, the wadi there, the valley between the two hills. And you might see a green pasture over there, but to get there, you've got to go down through this valley. And sometimes those valleys were not safe. Sometimes there were predators down there. You couldn't see very well down there. Because of the twists and turns, you couldn't see what was around the turn in the valley. Vision is, is limited in the valley. Predators, enemies are in the valley. If you were a traveler going through there, there could even be bandits in the valley. Flash floods happened often in the valley. Avalanches took place in the valley. But here we're told by the psalmist, his declaration is, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And why? And this is the point in the psalm where the psalm turns in worship directly to the Lord. Everything up to this point is the psalmist talking about the Lord the shepherd. At this point, he turns his voice to heaven itself and he says, For you are with me. Friends, you're walking through it. You're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Those are uncertain times. The latter part of verse 4. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I'm going to pause right there. 
your rod and staff. The rod was a weapon. Rod was a weapon. The rod was not, sometimes people say, yeah, they use the rod to correct the sheep. The rod was not used to correct the sheep. The staff, there was a function of the staff that was used to correct the sheep. The rod was a club. It was more like a baton. And whenever the foxes would begin to come, those shepherds became real good at using both the sling and the rod. The sling is not referred to in this psalm, but the rod, which was a weapon, is referred to. The shepherds developed a skill to fling that, that rod in such a way that it would hit the legs of the foxes and drive them away. And then he'd go and retrieve his rod. But the sheep would develop over time a sense of memory of what that shepherd had done with that rod in the past. Can you see this with me? The sheep may see a predator coming and they glance to the shepherd and they see the rod and they say, whew, okay, the shepherd's here. He's got his rod. He's delivered us before. He'll do it again. Yes! Your rod and staff, you're, you're armed, Lord. Hey, the she this shepherd's a warrior. This shepherd's a fighter. He's not going to let anything come against you without getting right there between you and that enemy himself. And your staff, comfort me. The staff was for direction. The, the, the shepherd would give direction in a very unusual way because they're, they're, the sheep, their faces were down most of the time. He, he would either use his voice, they recognize his voice, he would use the tapping of his staff along the rocks. They actually recognized the sound of his tap and would start going in the direction. I, I equate that with the small, still voice of God. I want to hear the slightest tap of the staff of Jesus. He shouldn't have to yell at me to get my attention. He shouldn't have to cause a calamity in my life. He doesn't cause calamities, by the way. He shouldn't have to allow something to happen in my life to, uh, to get my attention. I, I want to be so attentive to His voice that the, and to the sound that He makes that I hear the slightest tap of His movement and move his, in His direction. So it was used for, the staff was used for direction, guidance. It was used for rescue. You know that hook on the end of it? You know, sometimes these sheep, you know, you've heard... The, People say they're not all that smart. Well, I used to have sheep. So, by the way, anybody here ever raised sheep? I've got a few of you, but you can see why we have to teach about this because few of us can relate to this world. But a world of shepherding. I wasn't a shepherd. But sheep, they have this tendency to just follow one another. If they don't have a shepherd to lead them, they'll follow whoever looks like the leader. They may not really be the leader. And they may have some goat trying to lead them. But here, either a goat or a sheep is walking along in the desert, goes up into a crevice. That, that, that sheep could be walking around, come to a dead end of the crevice and just stand there. And because other sheep are following that, that sheep into a dead end, others will just go in and his head's right up against the backside there. And another one will come in after that and the shepherd said, where did those four go? And there they are in the crevice. He take his, he'd kindly just reach in with his hook, pull them out. One at a time, one at a time. Rescue and correction. There were times correction was needed and usually just a, just a blow to the hindquarters and the sheep would have an idea of what it needs to do. Verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You, pre you prepare a banquet, Lord, before me in full view of my enemies. Oh, but the devil is so beating up on me right now. He prepares a table for you, even in the very presence of your enemies. What, what we're saying here is you don't have to wait till your total breakthrough comes in the sense of all of your enemies be gone before you begin to feast at the table of the Lord. He's prepared a place for you today. You may get up tomorrow and go face some of the same things that you've had to face for the last three weeks. But it doesn't change the fact there is a bountiful spread on a table that He's prepared for you. You see, folks, this meandering path that you're on called the path of righteousness, it leads someplace. 
And the place that it leads, isn't it good to know that there is actually a destination in all of this? That our life does have a purpose. It's actually going someplace. In all the things we may suffer, the things we may struggle through, the uncertainties of life, going through the valley of the shadow of death, that crazy place of uncertainty, that place of impending danger and doom, that it's actually going someplace if we'll stay, uh, stay focused and clearly affixed upon the shepherd, the Lord our shepherd. And the place it's leading to is, is this place, the table of blessing, the destination. Even in the full view of your, of your enemies, it's still there. Verse 5, the latter part continues. You anoint my head with oil. Here's David. He was very familiar with shepherding. But he also was familiar with the concept of the king being anointed. Himself being anointed. If, if this was after the fact that he had been anointed. By Samuel. Anointed. Conveyed an idea of royal identity. Anointed conveyed the idea of presence of Holy Spirit. The anointing of the Spirit. The oil of anointing represented joy in places. The oil of joy. But it also represented a comfort that God wants to bring to us in times when we have been wounded and scarred by the things that affected us. These sheep, they would spend all day in the Judean sunlight and then at the end of the day, the shepherd would look at their face and often it was sun scorched and blistered. Sometimes the insects were there too, but the oil would be poured over the head and face of that sheep. And it wasn't so much that there was a medicinal quality to the oil. That wasn't really what the point was here. He would begin to rub the head of that sheep with the oil. There was something about the touch of his hand that brought assurance, that brought comfort, as well as a cleansing in those times. You anoint my head with oil, Lord. Would you just say that? You anoint my head with oil. You anoint my head with oil. Say it again. You anoint my head with oil. I want you to say it this way. I am anointed. I am anointed. Well, what do you mean? Is the Spirit of God in your life tonight? Now, if you've not yet received Christ, receive Him tonight. And receive His Spirit. And then you can receive that anointing too. That anointing manifests in different ways in different people. But you have an anointing on your life. If you're a child of God and the Spirit of God is in your life. And sometimes we just need to remind ourselves, I am anointed of God. You do not need to let the enemy any longer uh, pull you away from your purpose and your calling. Do not believe that lie of, oh, I'm not, I'm not anointed. I'm not favored by Him. He can't use me. You are, if you're a child of God, if you're one of His sheep, the Lord your shepherd is making sure that His anointing oil is pouring over your life. Amen. So that you anoint my head with oil and then He says, my cup runs over. It's like He's saying, at the end of this psalm, He's saying, all of this goodness, all of this that I'm celebrating, it's more than I can contain. It's more than I deserve. I'm just simply overflowing. My cup overflows. And then verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Can I say it like this? Surely goodness and mercy will hunt me down all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'd like to paraphrase it like this. From what I, this is like David talking. From what I can see, it looks like no matter where I go in life, goodness and mercy are going to hunt me down. He will see to it that His goodness and mercy chase after me. And when it is all over, I will dwell in the sheepfold of the Lord forever. 
My friend, I don't care where you've been, what you're going through, turn around and look. Goodness and mercies, close behind. And it's about to overtake you tonight. God's goodness, God's manifest mercy and love. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. I just want to go, I'm, I'm going to read to you now a paraphrase I've written of the entire 23rd Psalm just to wrap this up. Based on the things I've just taught you. The Lord is, no, it is the Lord who is my shepherd, my constant companion. What more could I want? I shall never lack what I need. His presence brings such satisfaction, comfort, and security that I'm able to lie down and rest in pastures of tender grass, pleasant places of habitation. He goes before me to the places that I fear and leads me beside still pools of water, waters of quietness, pools that he has prepared, places where my thirst might be quenched without fear of harm. For he has gone before me to minimize the danger. He brings back my vitality. My breath returns. My desire is renewed. He restores my mind, my will, my emotions. Can you just declare that with me tonight? He restores my mind. He restores my will. He restores my emotions. My very soul. Getting to where I need to go sometimes seems like walking down a meandering path with many twists and turns. I cannot navigate it alone. It is the Lord, my constant companion, who guides me. He knows the way. This path is the, right, is the right way to go. And following His lead is the right thing to do. I am confident that He will lead me in such a way that His name, authority, and character will be honored. And even though this path may take me through the valley of the shadow of death, the place of great danger and uncertainty, the very place where others have come to ruin and some have even been swept away, I will remain fearless. I will fear no calamity. For you are with me. Even your rod is a comfort to me. For I remember the times when you've driven the foxes away. How it comforts me to know that you will always be there to defend your own. Even your staff is a comfort to me. For I remember how you've often rescued me. I remember the times when I began to stray. And you're careful to correct me. Making certain that I would, I would not be separated from the flock. I'm even comforted by the sound of your staff tapping on the rocks up ahead. For when I hear that sound, I know which way to go. You prepare a banquet before me, even when my enemies surround me. But it's not for me alone that you prepare it. You've enabled me to sit down in the midst of my enemy and even be reconciled with them and eat with them in peace. When the day has been long and I've been scorched by the blazing heat of the sun, you lift my head and rub it with oil, comforting me in my affliction. This is more than I can contain. My cup overflows. As I reflect on how you've so greatly cared for me, I must draw this conclusion. For the rest of my life, goodness, mercy, and kindness will hunt for me wherever I go. And beyond this life, I will make my habitation in the sheepfold of the Lord forever. Throughout all eternity, you, O oh Lord, will always be our shepherd. Let's stand together tonight. Glory to God. Glory to God. Just praise the Lord, your shepherd, your constant companion. His eye is upon you. He's always with you. You thought you were alone. You thought that this thing of the nearness of God applied to somebody else. No, this is for you tonight. He knows you. He sees you. He's with you. Even now. Even now. Shut up eyes. Go to the Just pray in the Spirit for a few moments here. Praise God. Praise God. In a few moments, in a couple of minutes, we're going to go. I have two more things I need to do here tonight. We're going to. You can stay in that spirit of prayer. I don't want. I don't want to break that. You can do that. Can you listen and pray in the spirit at the same time? 
We're going to do two things before we leave here tonight. Number one, we're going to give you an opportunity to bring the tithe and offering. The reason I would like a little bit of that prayer and still going on because, because there's something about to happen in the room here in our prayer time. There's a momentum from the, the message that's just been preached that is going to be carried into our ministry time in just a few moments. In the book of Philippians chapter 4, it says this. And I'd like for the ushers to prepare to put the, the uh, offering containers on the edge of the platform here. I'm going to have you come forward in your giving. There are envelopes in the pew. You know how to fill those out. Make it out WHC if you're writing out a check. WHC for World Harvest Church. There's a place on there for credit card, debit card giving as well. The book of Philippians says this. Paul said, Indeed, I have all and abound. Philippians 4 verse 18. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you. He's talking to the Philippians. And basically, he's saying, every need in my ministry has been met. I believe the declaration of this ministry here is going to be consistently, every need in this ministry is met. I believe that with all my heart because this is good ground. The favor of God's upon this place and what's happening here. And the, the ministry of Rod Parsley, others who are serving here. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full. It's like I said, th thanks for your generosity and giving. I, this, the things that you've sent as an offering are a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. The reason I selected this is that you're not just giving to a ministry here not just to an organization you're not even you're not just giving to bills you're not just giving to meet a budget you're bringing a sweet smelling offering that's rising as a sacrifice tonight unto the Lord and yes he's talking about financial giving here an acceptable sacrifice well pleasing to God it's pleasing to God it brings a smile to his face when you're bringing from your substance into this time. And here's the promise part, verse 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. And Father God, I just pray for the activation of that, the fulfillment of that promise in every person's life here tonight. That dear God, that they would see breakthroughs in, in their finances, breakthroughs in relationships, in resources of every kind. Lord, that, that there be a sense of well-being in every area of their life tonight. Lord, for God, we have freely received. We now freely give tonight. In Jesus' name, may your blessing be rich and bountiful upon every person. In Jesus' name, amen.